If you want to achieve financial freedom and build generational wealth, then you need to be an investor, someone who allocates their capital efficiently into productive investments that help them grow their wealth over time. But the question is, what am I supposed to invest in? My name is Jacob Sandoval. I am the head of investor relations at the DeRosa Group. We're going to be breaking down the two most popular investments, stocks versus real estate. Let's get started with one of the criteria to compare these investment vehicles. And the first criteria is appreciation. And appreciation is the price or the value of the investment increasing over time. And stocks have famously been known to have very steady appreciation on average over the long term. So if you kind of look at the past 30 years, the stock market has gained anywhere from eight to 10% every single year on average. If we just take an example, if you invested 10,000 in the S&P 500 around 30 years ago, that investment would be worth $164,000 today, assuming you invested all dividends, which is not too shabby. So how does real estate kind of stack up to this? Real estate typically is known to have lower appreciation than the stock market. If you just look at the average price home over the past 30 years, they've kind of averaged a four to 5% appreciation. So stocks are the clear winner in terms of appreciation, right? Not so fast. There's a lot of different factors that kind of play into this. But one factor that's important is in real estate, you have the concept of forced appreciation. That is you buy a property under market value and you increase the value either through renovation or increasing the rents. And in that way, you can achieve a much stronger appreciation by forcing that appreciation. And that's what we do here at the DeRosa Group. We buy undervalued apartment buildings, which are valued on the income that is generating and through a series of renovations and unit turns and increasing the value and the attractiveness of those units, able to increase the rent, generate new income sources. We're increasing the value of that apartment building and that is forcing the appreciation, forcing the equity growth and passing that on to our investors. If we're just talking about normal real estate, then I would say that stocks are known to be the stronger appreciation vehicle. So maybe we can give this round to stocks, but just know that forced appreciation is a thing. So what is the second factor? That is cash flow. Because at the end of the day, if you want to retire early or you want to pay for your living expenses, then you're going to need your investments to generate cash flow. And for this, it's not even close. If we take a look at ticker symbol BOO, which is the ETF version of the S&P 500, they're paying a dividend yield about 1.5%, 1.6%. So if you invested $100,000 into ticker symbol BOO, you'd only be generating about 1,600 bucks a year or around $130 a month, which is not a lot of cash flow. You can't even really pay for Barry's Bootcamp with that amount of cash flow. Real estate is a much, much stronger cash flow generating vehicle. And this is why it's known to be one of the best vehicles for achieving financial freedom because you are able to generate that cash flow. For example, for one of our deals, DeRosa Capital 18, we're paying an 8% preferred return. So if you were investing $100,000 into DeRosa Capital 18, we'd actually be paying $8,000 a year in distributions. And as the rents increase over time, that distribution would likely increase over time as well. So real estate clearly wins the cash flow round. Moving on to what I'm going to call the level of effort and barrier to entry round. So in this, in my opinion, stocks are a lot easier than real estate. Typically, if you buy a stock, you can do so with a few clicks of a button and you can do it with as little as $1. You know, with fractional investing these days, you can invest very, very small amounts. You can do it in records amount of time with new apps like Robinhood and whatever trading app you like to do. So the barrier to entry for stocks is incredibly low and the amount of work that is required is so much lower. Now, real estate, on the other hand, if you're just going to buy real estate, it's definitely not passive and the barrier to entry is much, much higher. You have to put 20, 25% down on some of these properties and that could be a significant amount of money. And then when you acquire the property, you have to manage it and you have to consistently take care of it. Now, the caveat here is if you make a passive real estate investment, like a syndication, like what we do here at the DeRosa Group, then the level of work required is basically zero. You pick the operator, you pick the deal, and then you make that investment but after that, it's completely passive like the stock market. But for this category, I would say that the barrier to entry is still much higher in real estate than it is for stocks. And so for this level of effort slash barrier of entry round, I'm gonna go with stocks kind of win that round. 
Before we move on to the next category, I wanted to make an announcement. The DeRosa Group is very passionate about helping people achieve financial freedom. So passionate that we've made a free training on how to quit your nine to five job through passive investing. It is a super tactical training put on by myself and Matt Faircloth, and we give you tactics and the strategies to be able to quit your nine to five job in a realistic time frame. It's completely free, no fluff, no BS, a straight advice on how to leave your nine to five job. You can download that training for free by clicking the link in the description below. So what is the next category? Volatility. Volatility is the tendency of, of the value of your asset to fluctuate in price over time. And this, again, is not even close. Stocks are known to be very, very volatile investments. And the reason why that is, is because anybody could be a stock market investor. You, with a few clicks of a button, you can either buy or sell stocks. And it's really highly influenced by what's going on in the market. And things happen so fast. So one day, your stock portfolio could be up 5%. The next day, it could be down 10%. And it can move so freely in between that time. So over a long time horizon, it's smooth. But over the short term, it can be incredibly volatile. And so that is just the nature of the stock market. You have to be okay with that. But as you get nearer to retirement, you want the volatility of your portfolio and your investments to be a lot, lot less volatile, right? You can't tolerate large swings in the price value of your investments when you're nearing retirement because you can't really recover. And so how does real estate compare? Real estate, on the other hand, is not nearly as volatile of an investment. And the reason why that is, is because real estate is an illiquid investment, right? When you buy the property or when you invest in a syndication, the money's in there, but it's not liquid. It can't be freely traded. And in that way, it's kind of built in stability for the real estate market. So when you think about balancing your portfolio, having both stocks and real estate to balance the other is great because real estate is at the end of the day, just not going to be as volatile. The real estate prices and the real estate market does not move as quickly and as drastically as the stock market because it's not as easy to transact in the real estate market. So in this round, I say real estate is a clear winner. Moving on, leverage. Leverage refers to the ability to borrow money to control and own the asset. Can you borrow money to purchase stocks? Yes, that's referred to as trading on margin and it can be very, very dangerous, right? Because like we said in the previous criteria, the stock market is really volatile. So if you borrow on margin and then you buy more stocks and then that stock actually tanks in price, you're at risk of a margin call and you have to cover yourself off. And that's happened many, many times. Take a look at GameStop, you know, when they shorted GameStop and all of a sudden, they had to cover off that margin call. So it's very dangerous, very advanced, very risky. Real estate, on the other hand, it's not quite that. You know, it's very routine to borrow large sums of money where banks make out, give you a loan, and you can put down 20, 25% to buy a much larger asset. It's much more commonplace in real estate to do that because real estate is, you know, one of the safest assets to lend against. The bank feels very confident that if they're lending this large portion of the asset, that many people will pay back that loan. So the ability to borrow money to control the asset, especially when we're talking about large apartment buildings like we buy at the DeRosa Group, leverage amplifies returns. And so having the power of leverage is definitely a clear advantage of real estate over stocks. The next one is liquidity. Having investments in the stock market is, is basically as good as cash. You know what I mean? Any single time you want, when the market's open, you can sell your stock and convert that into cash. And so that's a big, big benefit of the stock market is the liquidity factor. Real estate, on the other hand, is not liquid at all. If you invest in a syndication, for example, you have to be okay with your investments being in there for five to 10 years on average, just depending on the business plan. And while that's great from kind of a volatility perspective and maybe great from a long-term growth perspective, you have to be okay that it's not liquid and you can't easily redeem that money. If you want to, not impossible, but it's a little bit harder to do that. So in this round, liquidity is definitely a benefit to the stock market. There are other vehicles like our vehicle, the DeRosa Income Fund, where it's liquid after one year. So you can invest in it and it's liquid after one year. And so there are ways that real estate can try to achieve that liquidity, but in general, stocks are a much more liquid vehicle than real estate, so they take that round. And we'll kind of round it out here and wrap up this video. Tax benefits is the last round, and this one is not even close. There are very little tax advantages to the stock market. You're either paying a short-term capital gains tax if you sell the stock in less than one year of ownership, or long-term capital gains tax if you held the stock longer than a year, and that's pretty much it. But you're still paying the tax men at the end of the day. Real estate, on the other hand, has a whole bunch of tax benefits, and I'm not a CPA, so talk to your CPA about that. But there's so many built-in tax benefits, like depreciation, and you could do things like cost segregation and bonus depreciation. And when we buy these large apartment buildings, 
we pass all of the tax benefits onto the passive investors. And so that's what we do at the DeRosa Group. And there are just a ton of tax benefits for real estate. So this is, in my opinion, the knockout punch for why real estate is a stronger investment in the stock market is because of the tax benefits. So that's all the time that we have here today. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope you found that video helpful. I hope you learned something about stocks and real estate. Again, I think it's good to have both so the pros can counteract the cons of the other, but both are definitely necessary. You know, we needed to diversify our investment portfolios as we're working our way to achieving financial freedom and building generational wealth. If you want to learn more about how the DeRosa Group can help you on your investment journey, feel free to book a call with me in the link in the description below. We're very passionate about helping investors build that generational wealth and you can schedule a free call with me by heading to the link in the description below. I will see you guys in the next video. Peace.